Welcome again uh, to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, today is Friday, and as we want to do on Fridays, we have um, folks to talk about transformation, organizational transformation, cultural shifts, and all those kinds of wonderful things. Um, and on uh, today, we have with us John Willis um, from the Global Transformation Office, and he's going to have a conversation about conversations, um, organizational conversations. I'm going to let John take it away and introduce himself, and we'll have live Q&A at the end. So, John, take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Diane. Thanks for everything you do for this. This is an awesome you and Chris. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so organizational conversations. What the heck is this? Um, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, I'll give you some insight of what I've been thinking about for the last two or three years and, uh, and actually having some fun at Red Hat doing some of this stuff too. So Jan Willis, I'm part of the Global Transformation Office and Jay Willis at Red Hat. Um, the, our team, if you've been uh, coming here on Fridays, you've probably gotten to meet um, Andrew Clay Schaefer. He's my boss, one of my best friends. I've been working with him for years. He, we, we kind of co-created on the shoulder of giants with many other people, but the DevOps movement. Uh, Kevin Bear next to him is the um, one of the authors of the Phoenix Project. That's me on the short guy there. And then Jay Bloom to my right has been working with Kevin for years, and I've known all these guys for years, and they're just, uh, I, I say that I feel like I'm uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory working with these guys. Uh, it's just an amazing team to be on. Um, Andrew likes to say we wrote some books, so I, I was the co-author of the DevOps Handbook um, and the Beyond the Phoenix Project, and I've got a, a fair amount of other publications that wouldn't fit on a page, but... So one of the things that, um, you know, I started thinking about, um, I won't give you my resume, go to my LinkedIn profile, Jay Willis, and I think it's John Willis Atlanta, something nonsensical like that. But uh, um, I was at Docker, and, you know, I'd been like 12 years um, in um, vendor space. I, I you know, Chef, I would start, I was very early Chef. I sold a company at Dell. I sold a company at Docker. And, um, and by the time I was ready to leave Docker, I was really excited about going out and being independent. Um, you know, I, I built enough um, mind share with the community. You know, before I had that run, which was about 12, maybe 15 years, but you know, nobody really knew me. Um, by the time I was sort of ready to leave Docker, which about three years ago, I, I built up enough mind share with the community. I thought, okay, I'm going to put a shingle out and I'm going to consult. And I and I thought, okay, I'm going to use all the things in DevOps Handbook: lean value stream mapping, impact mapping, just blah, this, 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 hosting. It's carry all these different things. Sorry, I mangled that. But um, lean and um, and my first client, I realized every time I tried to inject um, a framework or a model, the conversation just stopped. And then um, so so I, I started going around this idea that like if you really want to find the truth, and you really went to the you know, core of an organization's Sort of behavior or problems um, that, that you know you can't lean agile safe or even sorry kids even SRE your way around a bad organizational culture or more importantly bad you know institutionalized um, sort of memory muscle you know bad behaviors. So I, I started I didn't know I still don't really know what a great name of it is. I'm pretty sure organizational conversations is not it's just the one I, I called it in. Organizational anthropology. I've, other people have given it names to me, but it, it's really an idea where you, where I just literally go in and I, um, and I, I have conversations with people. So typically, I get to work. The only way this works is I work with usually a CIO. I say, here's how this is going to work. In fact, what typically happens is people say, John, can you come in and 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 sprinkle pixie dust all over our DevOps? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't work that way. And then, but what I can do is do this. And in a very few companies, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I'm interviewing the CIO because, you know, some chief of staff or somebody will, will bring me in to say, I'll tell the CIO, you need to hear John, you need to hear what he has to talk. And, and I'll, at the end of that, I'll go back to the person, the champion that tried to get me in there. And I'm like, you know what, your CIO is not ready for this. Like it, you will be wasting your time and wasting your money, right? So there's a synergy that I find where a CIO is willing to say, you know what, I'm I, I'm going to take a try on this, and then they blast out of you know, please pay attention, don't bring your laptops, you know, unless it's a fire, you know, but sit in the room with this person for an hour and a half or two hours, in different groups, 
and let him ask you questions. And when the CEO does that, most people show up, right? And um, and the one thing I've learned back to the frameworks, like my my instinct is like, as a trainer, as you know, somebody who speaks and you know tries to always sort of educate people, which is my nature, uh, whether I'm presenting or not, is that when you're in these conversations, you want to correct people if they say something like, oh, let me teach you. So that's not, you can't do that. I, I, you need to just listen. And that's sort of anybody's trying this model, just make sure. Because again, what you don't want to do is when you're into like 30 minutes of 15 or 20 people having this great conversation telling you how things really work, you, you don't want anything to derail that. So the other thing I think a lot about is, you know, Andrew, Andrew Clay Schaefer, uh, you know, I, I think he's the first time I've seen it in the DevOps world. He, he took, Andrew's great at like metaphors. He's awesome. Um, he did the blind, you know, DevOps, you know, uh, sort of a DevOps, you know, b blind person and, you know, sort of the elephant. And it, it's a, it's an old sort of metaphor. And, and I, I look at this as like, the, you know, this is what leadership, right? They're, they're sort of the, um, the CEO is touching the um, trunk and he, he thinks it's a snake. Um, Maybe the 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 CTO she's um, touching the, um, the 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 tail and and she thinks it's a rope on and on right and and but the thing is it's it's this is sort of systemic of the problem right you have the blind IT right where dev is touching and and you know possibly just to just really just trash the metaphor um, the the leadership one is uh, you know is a purple elephant and. And the uh, the IT one is uh, is an orange elephant. So they again not even be able to see that the context is different from release and network and dev, right? And they, like so, this is just the what you know. We all know this, right? IT is an elephant, right? In, in today's world, it's a very very complex structure. And I, you know, I thought I'd have a little more fun, you know, that maybe governance, risk, and compliance. It's not even an elephant, right? It's not even just a different color. It's the giant attacking rabbit. You know the 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 Trojan rabbit, right? Monty Python, right? So, um, so I hope you get the point, right? Like that 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 is the problem, right? Our, sort of our context, our individual, our team, our group, even our leadership contexts are are you know um, we see things in, with different um, you know memory models or mo models, cognitive models, right? And so that's just human nature, right? So right off the bat, we're hosed. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll do fine. So I, I, there's this notion, um, if you've ever started a company, you, you'll, or you do start a company, you'll, you'll be turned very early by somebody, usually your lawyer, that there's this thing called piercing the corporate veil. Which means that if you don't act like a corporation, um, you know, the uh, IRS could come in and say, you have no, you know, you have no journals, you have no sort of meeting notes. Anyway, they call it piercing the uh, corporate veil. But, um, but I, I, I I think this is like what I call piercing the organizational veil, right? Which is, um, you know, the, the veil is th this adversary relationship of consultants come in, and and then the people who are sort of doing the work are um, like, well, here comes the bobs, right? The bobs in in office hours, a classic example, right? Like you don't want to tell them anything, or you're afraid to tell them anything, or you need to always spin things that they're better than they aren't because you you don't want to be the one that gets fired. Um, so what I have to do is come in and earn trust, or somebody who sort of evolves this model, earn trust so they don't seem like the bombs. And I need to, I, I can't ask you questions like, how is your CMDB? How accurate is it? Oh, John, it's fine. You know, and you no, uh, no open um, uh, critical vulnerabilities or um, CVs, CVS is on your production system. Oh no, no, not at all, John. Don't worry, right? Like so, you have to you have to sort of gamify a little bit, but it's it's a trust. It's a getting people to sort of open up to you. And actually, it's not that hard. Uh, you know, sometimes I walk in a room and I just say, "Hey, what's wrong with this place?" And then I just take notes for another hour and a half. Um, and you can't shut people up. And so it's 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 conversations at the edge. It's another really important thing about this is that. Um, is that, you know, a lot of times when I come in, I've been called the anti-McKinsey, right? Which is like such a compliment, right? You know, so I, I shouldn't call it any, so think of McKinsey as any one of the large consulting companies. But but the model of, of most of our industry is they come in and they already know what they're gonna tell you and they do a little bit of lip service to, um, they, oh, we wanna listen, but they don't really. They really, they're just trying to convince senior leadership that they've listened and that they they have the right answer. 
And, and, and so one of the things about this model, and I call it a model as a stretch too, I, I don't really know what it is yet other than I know it works, is that, um, is that I honestly, even though I have lots of sort of meta and, and process of how to do things, you know, as an educator, as an implementer, as a, you know, quote unquote thought leader, which is a terrible phrase, but for lack of a better one. Um, but I really try not to go in with the solution. And the other thing is, I don't really want to have an in-depth conversation with the leadership. I want to have, you know, uh, you'll see some examples in a model in a minute, but I want to have long, long conversations with people, what I call on the edge, the people who put their fingers on the keyboard. And if you can get enough of them to tell you what's going on, the, you, you give this beautiful look of outside in that most organizations have never really done to this level. You know, surveys, they don't work, right? Um, or, or let me speak, they don't give you this level of truth and depth to what your problems really are. I mean, I can generically walk in the door and say, I'm your bank, I'm pretty sure you have this, 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 and this problem. And chances are I'm about 80% right. And anybody else who has a reasonable understanding of what we do in things called DevOps or transformation. But the truth is, I don't really know if I'm right. When I know I'm right is when I can connect the dots from what people say. Right, so, and the other thing I, I realized over time is, you know, when you're going in and you're doing all this sort of analysis, I mean, basically you're just discovery. I mean, you're just taking notes with hundreds of people. And then you have to figure out like, how do I take all this stuff? Because Joe said, oh my goodness, you know, we have no sense of priority here. You know, Sue says, well, our budgets are, you know, ridiculous. We get yearly budgets and they change every three weeks on what we should do, right? And you're not like, you're not getting all that stuff in like categorized discussions. They're like, you're, when you go back to your notes. And then, so the first thing I realized is I had to come up with these sort of buckets in a reasonable way to sort of capture, I mean, and not, not all things are perfect. There, there certainly are other buckets, but I, I, I use this as my, uh, as my framing for how I go about trying to, um, do um, like a quality, a quanti qualitative analysis of everything I heard. And, and typically it stems into the seven, it could have been six, it could have been eight, <laughs> seven just sounds cooler. Um, invisible work, we'll talk a little about that. It, you know, it's, it's about work that's just, you know, downstream dependencies that aren't captured, work that isn't captured because you have so many different management systems. Uh, management system toil, uh, probably the worst offender of management system toil is when I work in an organization and I find they have seven ways to capture work, you know, SharePoint, Jira, um, messages, email, um, you know, uh, remedy tickets, right? You know, uh, work work tickets and remedies, ARS, um, and, and none of that's aggregated or correlated. And, and, and in the end, a lot of data is missing from what you actually do. So not, so it stems back to invisible. And then misaligned a sentence, we know that that's a great narrative of the DevOps story, but but you know, we think the roadmap is this, but then I've been told I have to do this, and um, and you know, and even the dev and ops is this classic core chronic conflict, right? Dev, you know, classically dev wants to move fast and you know get things out the door. Operations is resilience and scale, and like look, we need you know, so um, so again the whole and 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 again in in those classic scenario operations will get rewarded by uh, reducing impact incidents and those things development will get rewarded based on delivering things on time and features, right? And right there, there's, there's a misalignment in there. Uh, tribal knowledge, for any of you have read the Phoenix Project, right? The Brent, classic example. Uh, you know, the, these, the, there are these sort of pockets of um, tacit knowledge that, that, um, that the people just don't know. And it, you know, when you start interviewing people and you'll get a, a, a flock of younger people who'll be like, I just never know how to do this. And then some uh, sort of seasoned person in the back room will say, oh, that's easy. You just go to Bob. And they're like, yeah, I went to Bob, but he's too busy. And, you know, and, and I asked Bob, could you explain how you do this? And Bob's like, I'd love to, but I don't have time, right? So the whole Brent character who is, you know, that, that, you know, and, and the more often not, it's not the person who's trying to preserve their job. It's just somebody who likes to help everybody and tends to be, you know, doesn't really realize they're a bottleneck, right? Um, you know, I think at one point somebody categorized Brent as a rotten person and Gene Kim who wrote the book was like, 
you know, like, oh my God, no, that, if you read it that way, that was, that was, that was totally not what we wanted, you know, and Kevin Bear was, it was a, a big part of who works on GTO, it was a big part of that Brent character as well. Um, Incagoo and organizational design, we can go on and on, you know, the, the, you know, anywhere from, and it's not just sort of, um, you know, the sort of um, waterfall, not waterfall, but, um, but microservices versus monoliths, right? That's a part of a sort of inverse Conway maneuver, if you're familiar with Conway's law. But it's organizational as well. Um, there's a great story, of the Equifax breach, right, where the, um, the CISO reported to the chief, uh, the chief legal officer. And, and when they did, uh, the um, Congress actually did a postmortem. If you haven't read it, it's, an, it's a fantastic document. They, they interviewed the CISO and they asked, well, when you knew that the, you know, PII and there was like you were, there was a compromise, um, why didn't you go to the CIO? And the answer was, I didn't think of it. And like, that's a classic, I think, Conway Lawism in that their mindset was all the things that were required from a legal perspective, right? So in and organizational design, just understanding complexity, right, through this, um, we'll talk a little later about incidents and just understanding that these are complex systems. You need to have system thinking. You need to understand blameless. Um, you know, um, you, it's a whole different way of thinking about failure. And then last but certainly not least, um, you know, security. And and what I love about this model is it, it almost always funnels down to something that I want, I call security and compliance data. So let me uh, move on a little bit. Um, you know, this is just a model from uh, Elliot Gorat, who was the person who wrote the goal and the, that the Phoenix Project was modeled off. It's about thinking about um, complexity in a different way. You know, in, in a lot of ways, when you go into an organization and you start asking questions, uh, they start giving you these abstract answers, with, which are basically telling you stories where what you really need to do is find out, so I don't want those first order answers of the problem. Like John, the CMD is fine. Okay, let me ask you, what did you do last time when you had to deal with a remedy for sort of some incident to find all the systems that were impact? Like I use my spreadsheet. Oh, why didn't you use the CMD? Oh, because it's a piece of junk, it's not accurate. And so the process I go through is um, this, it, 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 I, I've, I've kind of over time gotten to into model. It's a little different now. I've done a couple of virtual, which are, it's just different. Uh, one client, it's like the, one of the top three or four banks in the world I did last summer. I spent 30 days um, in London. Um, that shouldn't give you a hint, but uh, um, I actually became a bachelor and I interviewed 400 people. I, I just stayed there. I actually got to go to a pub at night, which is like a lifelong dream of mine. Um, but but the, the process is, you know, you have these initial calls. I'll talk about this pre-assessment leadership call. You know, I say I don't really want to hear from leadership too much, but there's, there's a little bit of a head fake process I go through. And then there's the online uh, analysis. Um, and, 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 and to be clear, although I'm not a scientist, I do work with a couple now, but, uh, but it's, it, it's qualitative analysis, not quantitative, right? I'm not just counting the things. I'm literally trying to put categories, initial readout, report, final report. Uh, this is example of that, that large financial institution I did last summer. Um, you know, 300 uh, to 50 assessment team meetings. Um, it was actually about three, it was more than 200 people. It was, it was in the neighborhood of 350, uh, 400 pages. In fact, this book, right, um, I'm getting better at, at creating uh, systems that I don't have to have notebooks, but I, I'm just old school. See, I, if you look at that notebook, it's color coded and stuff, so those become the categories. I literally had a DCIO at this bank at the end. So one of the things that I don't do is I write down everything everybody says, but is part of the qualitative analysis, a fancy way to say it, I aggregate the stuff. Nobody's name gets bubbled up. It's all like, I've heard this thing, you know, 15 times. I'm pretty sure this is one of the most important things that we should probably address. And then I use it for a quote wall if I get called on by the CAO. But I'll never call anybody out for what they, what I wrote down as a quote. But I, but I had a DCIO offer me $10,000 for this book after they were already paying me a big money for the engagement. Right, this was a, a personal, and you know, the answer was no. You know, sorry, that's my promise to the people I interview. This is the thing, I actually got this from Kevin Bear. Um, you know, if, if I haven't said I love working with my GTO team, let me say it again, I love working with my GTO team. Um, the Kevin Bear, and he says it's from Ellie Gorat, which, you know, that's great, right? Um, 
even better is this idea like i figured out and I, I don't do this all the time it just depends on the circumstance but when i when i get to interview leaders i don't i don't want to ask questions a different way so one of the things that this technique is really works well is you walk in the room and you're in the office and they're about to tell you their resume and what they did like oh hold on a second before we get started i want to ask you a question and you say what are the five things that xyz your corp is not doing it should do and then they're like oh it's like you just threw water in there cold water in their face they're like huh and then the next thing you know, they just start rattling stuff off. And then to get a, you know, sometimes you got to stop them at 10 or 15 and only ask for five. And, uh, and I've had comments like, wow, this was therapeutic. Or I can't believe I just told you all that stuff, right? Uh, it, it, it really, and, and it really sets the foundation. In fact, I was forced to do this because I had to prove that this would work to one CIO. So they wanted to start off with a smaller engagement. And I typically would say no to that, but it was doing it for a friend. Who, a, a real friend that brought me in and you know he needed something to change there um and you know, when i went back to say oh this is your leadership like you know your number one problem is communication and and, and everybody in the organization told her that it was capacity and she knew it wasn't capacity even one of the big four told it was capacity they told them they had to uh, consolidate offices and like all this stuff and their number one problem for the leadership team was communication Right. And like she knew she didn't know what it was, but she knew there was something ahead of capacity. Right. Um, and that's what got the rest of the, the um, engagement going. And, and, you know, the obvious findings that you see everywhere is high waste, high wait time, silos, obviously variation, low collaboration, low trust, low visibility, low automation. But the key is, again, you know, and, and I've done this. So and my friends do this and our industry does this. You know, we companies come in and say, let us train you on this new technique. And then so you get this like training budget and you go in and you, you learn all this really cool stuff. But you didn't ask and you didn't know what the problem was first. Right. Like and the training probably will fit. You know, there are some great I'm actually going to show some of the, the examples of roadmaps that I give from people who do training including Red Hat, of course. But, um, but like the idea of just coming in and, and creating a training budget for like a thousand people on some new thing, when you haven't even asked the people who do the work, what's wrong? Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> maybe I'm living on an island all by myself. I wish I was right now, but hey. Um, the, um, so, but then we get into the sort of rote like meetings and like virtual is a little different, but um, you know, um, just the nature of virtual is, you know, normally what I do is try to have one meeting for a whole day, another meeting for a whole day. Um, now doing an hour and a half, two hour meetings, um, it just, it just, you know, virtual and all that just makes sense. It's just, and it actually, I didn't think it would work. It's actually working better than I thought. And then I have to go through some process of qualitative analysis and, and actually, again, working with a guy like Jay Bloom, right? Jay has uh, got a PhD in, in design transition and like, we're going to work together. Uh, sorry, Jay, if you're listening. I've already recruited you, um, but um, to, to make me a better scientist. Although I was talking to John Allspar the other day who does very list stuff on incident. And he says that maybe one of my, the one of the things that might make this great is I'm not a sci not, not a sort of academic based scientist. I don't know, we'll figure it out. Top five, visibility, prioritization, toil, inconsistency. But here's the thing, I don't know. I mean, well, likely these are the problems. If you're a hundred year old bank and you're sort of early on on your transformation and you've got sort of pockets of DevOpsisms, you know, probably three or four of these are gonna hit. And I could walk in as a high paid consultant and throw my DevOps handbook at you and say, I know how to fix this, right? But like, I don't until I listen, right? Um, you know, and then, you know, so like, all right, so now it gets a little sort of easier. So now you're mapping all the analysis to the top. And here's the other thing too, right? Not all parts of your organization move at the same speed. So you can't just tell everybody, hey, let's safe on Monday and the world will be awesome. But you have to meet people where they are, like the legacy mainframe people. Like I started my career. The one thing that makes this really cool for me is you can't stop me. Right? Like you can start asking about COBOL on DB2 on IBM mainframe. I'm like, yeah, I wrote, I started my career as writing mainframe, IBM mainframe assembler for 10 years. Like uh, Wax MQ, uh, you know, JBoss, of course, or um, you know, RabbitMQ, or um, 
you just go down the list, right, of all these different systems that, um, you know, um, but the point is, um, this is just an example. Um, the, the real magic is figuring out your capacity, the different speeds, how do you apply different techniques at different speeds in the organization? Um, it's not like just, hey, everybody DevOps. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Some people are ready, some people are not. Um, so when I say this, you know, I do think there are some common themes that I kind of call the operator's guide, right? You know, they want to create an operator's guide or, you know, if you want to be fancy, call it, you know, XYZ Kata, XYZ Corporation Kata or, um, you know, or the shared agreement, right? Um, I was talking to a company the other day where they're, they're, the new CIO really understands what he's doing and he has this idea how he's going to re factor the organizational structure ask me if it sounds is it sound i'm like yes that sound but it will fail if you don't have that operator's guide across all those things these common things that we all have to understand as the true knots right and so of course automation but taxonomy like maturity like again going back to the speeds like you want to get everybody to the same place true north but you figure you know some people and there's different maturity models badging or different things that may or may not work but the point is you know somebody might start off as yellow somebody might be orange somebody be light green right and and like the point is you're going to get them all in sort of directionally the same way and then i find taxonomy might be one of the biggest problems in organizations is people use about 10 different terms and there's basically a thousand variations of those 10 different terms. So the people are having meetings and they don't even know they're not talking about the same thing. It's just amazing how just simplifying a common taxonomy in an organization might actually be the, the, the most easiest thing to do and solve such a, a large variety of problems. Uh, learning, understand team, 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 you know, team turnover, how you organize teams, you know, you. You might say we're agile and we're doing, you know, we we you know we do sprints and scrum, and then I find out that you what you're really doing is do whack-a-mole on teams. You're putting a bunch of people together for like six sprints, then you're reallocating them to some other places. And I'll talk a little about cognition and load and learning of teams a little bit. And then depending on how old your bank is, um, you know, you might be bogged down in NFRs or you know service management, idle processing. Sometimes, you know, banted on the GRC, uh, you might have groups that are doing it incredibly slow paces. You know, it, it is amazing to me to walk into a top 15 bank today and still here in 2020 that it takes, you know, two to four weeks to get a compute instance. I, the one I heard recently would blow me away is, hey, John, it takes me about a minute and a half to two minutes to get an Amazon instance but it takes me another two weeks to use it. Like, what are we doing here, folks? <laughs> right, um, right, like we, we have, you have to figure this out. So if you keep thinking that, and I'm a big fan of cloud. I'm a big fan, if you don't know me, of, you know, of containers, you know, OpenShift. I think the, the platform model is the right way for the future. But like, if you're building all this stuff on a platform and there are people out there that you're not talking to and saying that platform is great, but it still takes me two weeks to get a compute instance to run a test, right? Um, general visibility, um, I, I won't go through all these. I will make this deck available. Inconsistent row, this is the thing where you, it's not like what's on the screen, it's what's going on, right? Which is, you know, like the, there are these sort of notional beginning of year roadmaps, and then, you know, six or eight months, people, the people that I talk to, like they have no idea what we're doing. They think we're doing all this, but every three weeks, I'm told to change to do this. Too many practice, way more projects than there are people. So having not even the visibility to just show the chart that you are over compat, you know, your 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 allocation of you know what you believe is the uh, the capacity that you're running is 150 beyond, and that's not even counting the hidden work that doesn't get calculated in the yearly budgets and and bottlenecks, uh, too much work in progress. Like there's not even sort of a sense of whip going on right um, or if it is it's localized like that 
you know, I'll run out of time, I'm sure, but sorry. You know, the thing I love, like, is, you know, and I'm not an agile expert, and it, like, I, you know, I learn enough to be smart about, from, I learn enough from the really smart people to be smart enough to be able to have the smart conversations, if that even makes sense. So, but when I walk in a room and I talk to a bunch of people and I talk about uh, story points and all that, and I already know they're date driven. I mean, I know they're date driven, right? Like, like so, like, I don't have to be an expert in all things agile and, and scrum and everything else. I just, you know, like simple math. I know they're date driven and I want to hear them explain story points. Now, I actually have heard viable answer story points, but more often than not, it's this fun game of, well, John, we do this. I'm like, okay, but. Isn't this, isn't there a date on this project? Yeah, but, but you don't, you know, like, yeah, but I don't get the, you know, aren't you just reverse engineering the story points to meet the date? Well, if you put it that way, John. <laughs> anyway, so I hope you're sort of laughing. I can't hear you when, when you're doing this virtual, but like hopefully somebody just laughed a couple of times. Um, conflicting priorities, unknown dependencies, right? Um, all right, I'll tell this story really quickly. Like. So um, I, one of the stories I love in the Phoenix Project, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle it, but, but there's a story about where they're all in the boardroom and somebody's saying, well, why does it take 63 hours to do a 15-minute task? You know, and, and, then, um, and then it's explained to them, okay, let me explain. So it's a very simplistic, you know, queuing theory. And if people are 90% busy and they're doing something that has um, – this, you know, very simplistic, but everybody's 90% busy, which is not too far from a lot of organizations I visit. And um, everybody has, um, you know, seven downstream dependencies in everything they do. I, I got past, like, you know, algebra, I think, and that's not algebra, but, like, it's, what, 62 hours, right? And, and here's the thing, when I, when I go in and I start asking questions about how they capture work, and I find out that 70% of all the work in that company from the IT perspective, isn't captured, you know, and, and I have this great conversation with the CIO, I'm like, um, how do we do it, John? I'm like, eh, not, not real good, Bob. I'm like, what do you mean, John? I'm like, well, you know, uh, let me put it this way. If you, if you built airplanes, I wouldn't fly on them. Oh, no, John, uh, come on, be a little service with me now. I'm like, okay, Bob, as far as I can tell, you have a, a $3 billion IT budget, um, and you only capture about 30% of all the things that are happening, in your IT, and I'm wondering what other part of your business would tolerate that. <laughs> Finances, ah, we reconcile the books every Wednesday if it's not raining, right? Um, you know, and then, you know, furthermore, when I'm talking to people about that sort of process, I say, why don't you write, well, how come you don't create a ticket to that? Or, and I don't believe, you know, we have a whole discussion about like ticket queues and all that. That's terrible stuff. But, but why isn't there any, why aren't you keeping any electronic document on that work, this work you just told me about? Oh, I've been working with uh, Sally for like 15 years. I know when Sally gives me something, it's only going to take me 15 minutes. Okay. Let me ask you something. Does that thing you do for Sally need file space? Does it need to be uh, dealt with like with LDAP or, or Active Directory? Oh, of course it does. Of course it does. Like how long those things? Well, that's not my problem. Right? So the, it's a, the context of the, the view of how long it takes is already skewed. Because in their mind, it's 15 minutes, but it's, you know, back to the Phoenix Project story, it's maybe 63 hours. Unplanned work, neglected work, right? Like, you know, we got some of that going on. Um, consistency, um, shared environments, right? You know, I'm again, like, if I knew how to answer all these questions, I wouldn't be here on this call right now. I'd be on, like, some ridiculously expensive fishing boat on the Gulf of Mexico, maybe calling people periodic to see how they were doing. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Shared service environments are terribly hard, right? Like if you're running um, these very complex systems that have legacy code, you can't have four environments of certain kind, like TIBCO or, or um, you know, large um, gateways and um, you know, MuleSoft gateways or whatever, right? Like not every organization, and I can't walk and say, oh, your big problem is you need like, you know, eight of these for everybody. Like, you know, of course that's not going to be the answer, but it's still a problem, right? Because you've got this sort of yo-yo effect on shared environment. Somebody's moving up, you go to test, you got to move it back down to a release. Somebody left some artifacts. You know, it's, it's just a mess. Inconsistent environments. Things like Ansible, you know, or Chef or Puppet, you know, configuration as code or, or infrastructure as code, right? Like, again, when I walk into an organization in 2020 and it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's a plus $2 billion IT budget, 
and they're like, yeah, next year we're thinking of looking at infrastructure as code. So you just told them you're manually building stuff? <laughs> okay, sure. I mean, again, I'm, I'm being a little funny and sounding judgmental, but and I don't do this when I'm doing this with clients, but sometimes you can't help but laugh among friends, and y'all are my friends, right? Unclear roles and responsibilities. You know, we could go through anti-patterns with CICD, um, and I uh, just got a ping. My boss is yelling at me. No, no, that's just not totally kidding. Um, you know, they, 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 there's tons of stuff written about anti-pattern CICD. Uh, Cross-functional chaos, right? You know, makes your space, and you know, the, in one team, the, the the there's team members that actually uh, are cross-functional to somebody else, and another group there they report to this one, but they're cross-functional. You know, it's just like there's a lot of chaos in how you. Um, and again, I'm not saying like product owners and product managers or technical leads or you know technical product owners and and back to the taxonomy, right? Like getting all that straight. Um, not market oriented. We have a whole bunch of this stuff in the DevOps handbook about that. Uh, here's another area, right? Like um, strategy, right? Strategy is usually a mess. There's sort of common strategy, or you might say compliance strategy. And then sometimes they are, sometimes they're not in sync with the architect's strategy. And almost always, where companies are emerging on cloud native patterns or decoupling or, you know, sort of, you know, maybe microservice to, to really flesh it out or um, just sort of going all in on the cloud. The, a lot of those organizations, the architectural teams and the engineering teams are on complete different planets, right? And then, um, you know, I should add network here too, but uh, security and network, right? Like. Uh, a lot of those are sort of latent. Like you get through the process, and then security comes in and says, "You, you can't use that version of TLS." Oh, all right. that's going to be a problem, right? Um, you know, so you know, we're not. I mean, we're getting better, you know. And again, there's a lot thought of. We say Red Hat, you know, just to be clear. I think Red Hat has <laughs> Red Hat. There we go. Been doing too much work this week. It's a Friday. Um, Red Hat has a lot of really good leadership, uh, starting with End the rest of the organization with GTO, but, you know, about how we are getting better in, you know, we have something called the five elements. Andrew, you know, if you've been listening to this this, um, this series, you know, you had it already. Uh, Jabe has, you know, we all, Jabe is an inventor of this three economy. So, I mean, we're working really hard to solve these problems, right? So, but again, a lot of corporations, you know, this strategy is just, they all have different arrows pointing in different directions. Uh, general risk, um, you know, risk in general, right? I, I do a lot of work on automated governance. You can look it up. Um, maybe we'll get some links to some of the projects, or DevOps automated governance, cloud automated governance. But, you know, most organizations are still perimeter-based, right? Their, their mentality was, um, I, I could tell you, I, it was clear, um, you know, it, it called these counterfactuals when you go in and you read a postmortem of an organization and say, well, I know what they should have done. And so, when I say this, I don't know what Equifax should, should have done because I don't know, but I do know that I got a sense that they were some myopic notion of perimeter-based, right? And and this is true. Like if I spend a ton of money on IDSs and protect the perimeter, I mean, Martin Casado, who was the, uh, the sort of the creator of software defined networking, um, was creating the CIRA, sold it to VMware, and now he's at and he's in Horowitz. So he's one of the leaders in network people in the world, a uh, brilliant guy. Um, you know, he said, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I saw a presentation that our industry spends about 80% of its spend on perimeter base and less than 20% on inner perimeter, right? Uh, subjective governance models, right? So a lot of what we do from audit and control is basically subjective in that, um, in that, you know, what does an order do? They come in and they look at the conversation in a change record for the evidence or maybe screen prints as opposed to possibly injecting what I would call objective governance into your pipeline, you know, maybe something like a blockchain and stuff like that. Um, low attestation efficacy, so that's back to, you know, a high attestation efficacy, that it would be something like, you know, a, sort of like a blockchain evidence for audit. Um, data ops, interesting conversation starting, so attestations for how data moves. You know, most of the largest breach and the most worst breaches are not about, like, the vulnerability and struts to Jakarta. It's about finding data that probably shouldn't have been sitting there. So if we had attestation models or evidence of how data gets transformed and placed in S3, the NSA breach, same thing, uh, you know, stuff in S3 buckets. Um, so the working model typically, you know, uh, again, not all not all the same. Uh, this is when I start to do, 
I've done with the um, the analysis, I start thinking about what are these things and what order they should be put in, or are there other things I need to add, but taxonomy models, uh, understanding roles and responsibility, community practices, you know, open org stuff is, you know, works really well if it hasn't been added. Really understanding how, um, you know, 2020 incident and problem management look, uh, service transition, upskilling, and outcomes. Um, I'll go again a little a little faster. It's hard to do this faster because I love talking about this stuff and I think it's pretty good information. I also say you need to proportionalize your GRC, right? Like, you know, if there's a hundred things in your risk definitions, and uh, and there are people arguing that there should only be ten, you know, maybe you can compromise at twenty or thirty. Uh, there's also uh, patterns that you know I can talk about, or if you hit me up, um, you know, Jay Wilson Red Hat, talk about how there's uh, this interesting way that you can create. Um, Sort of emergent GRC. So instead of sort of rewriting all the the 400 column uh, risk spreadsheets or you know 15 stacks of books of all the, the corporations uh, sort of risk definitions, you can actually start building through sort of evidence and emergence. It's pretty cool. Uh, long lived teams. Um, you know the, the, this idea of whack a mole teams. You know taking a bunch of people and Okay, for the next six weeks, we're going to put Sally, Bob, and Tom and Jam together. And then when that's over, I get, well, you know what? I need to pull Bob out of there early because he needs to start this new team. The teams are not getting, learning how to function. There's a lot of research on, on, on like how long, I think it's three months before a team actually starts to bond. And if you're ripping them apart, you just, you're not getting, the whole reason why you might have wanted to go to build run teams or two pizza teams was for that synergy and bonding. Building trust in the pipeline, I think we understand that, taxonomies and incident. Uh, consistency, um, uh, invest in common automation, of course, team autonomy, trust, uh, taxonomies are talked about. Um, again, you have to break that date driven, and I'm not saying this is easy, because it starts from the top, right? There's build the bank, run the bank, right? Like, that is the, in most companies, that's how it starts. And so you're playing this, like, shell game at DevOps at the bottom, when at the top, it's already been decided sort of arbitrated on there's going to be a part of the bank that's run the bank and there's a part of the bank that's going to be changed the bank and guess what if you fall into the run the bank <laughs> you're the furniture um you know so we're not going to really invest aggressively in those new fancy uh, picnic tables um the um so you so you really have this it's been called agile budgeting i don't i'm not crazy about that term but like the, you have to sort of break that you get a budget at the beginning of the year you know, what happens? You know, I would say the first quarter, you're like, ah, we got the budget, it's great. Second quarter, like, we really should start working on that, you know, working out that budget stuff. Third quarter, like, oh my God, we're getting close to fourth quarter. What are we gonna do? And fourth quarter, like, oh, you know, ah, you know, Titanic. Um, organizational change management. Again, um, you know, I think with everything, um, you know, we have to move away from quantitative, you know, looking at, like, from the leadership perspective, like, how many of these did you get done? How do you, like, you really have to sort of look at that and just sort of, smash it to say, if this is not qualitative, you know, you can't um, expect somebody, this is a true story, right? Somebody comes in, they're on a project, and the first time that everybody meets about the project, the whole project on the screen, um, put a schedule and status is green. And that person says, uh, yeah, you know, half of that screen shouldn't be green. And like, after meeting, somebody comes up to them, you know, hey, you, know, you really shouldn't say that in a meeting. So the next time they come back, the next meeting, they say, oh, you know what? A quarter of that team shouldn't be green. Manager pulls them apart. Like, Dude, didn't I tell you? Like, you really should not, you know, you're not a team player, and I'm going to ding you <laughs> next year on your, your bonus. And what do they do about the fourth, fifth time they come in? Like, Bob, what do you think? Do you think that screen's all green? Yes, Bob's your uncle. Um, you know, so, um, like, you have to break it. Agile funding. Um, Zero trust model, shift left security. Again, I've got a lot of presentations on this. Um, we've done a couple in this forum. I'm sure I'll do more. Policies code, this is really interesting stuff. I'm about to work on a new working group here. Um, I, I worked on a paper called DevOps Automated Governance. It's a creative commons on the itrevolution.com site. Um, we're actually gonna do a second version on that. Where we're gonna really focus in on policy. So policy people writing human readable YAML that gets injected into attestations in the pipeline that become the evidence for audit, right? Um, and if you can get that, you can actually start looking at something like policy error budgeting. Um, I talked about data ops, um, 
you know, and then really understanding the new world of configuration, right? We, we, we know the sort of Ansible, Chef, and all that, but all the configuration that goes into containers and, and, and clusters and managers like Kubernetes or OpenShift, right? There's a ton of vulnerabilities there, and it's really hard to keep up. So um, really understanding, the, you know, a, a switch that you turn on in a container could be no op by not turning a switch on, on in OpenShift, right? So... Um, Common language, uh, you know, this is from Jane uh, Grohl, who does a great job of, of sort of talking about DevOps SRE and ITIL. She's an ITIL expert, you know, for years. But just like, it's kind of fun if you look at some, we're gonna have some funds like a CI for sort of DevOps SRE with continuous integration. It would be called a CI configuration item in CMDB. Configuration management would be something like Chef or Puppet Ansible. In ITIL speak, it would be a CMDB. And you get the point, right? And and then what, you know, and then you have this, um, other thing that I think is important, we do a pretty good job in DevOps Handbook, is sort of understanding the roles of your organization. Um, I think most organizations would agree, but not one size fit all, that you want to move sort of to the right. You want to move away from I shape, where somebody's an expert in one topic, to maybe T shape, where they're really good at, like, so for example, like an Oracle DBA might be an I shape. Um, somebody who, an Oracle DBA that really becomes T-shaped might actually learn Python or, and then really start exploring on being, having that same level of expertise on MySQL or sort of other relational databases, or maybe even taking on some of the non-relational. And then E-shape, you know, I mean, it just depends on where you went. I, I, I you know, I think I detest the, the, the phrase full stack engineer. There's a whole book on it about it, why you should have they test it in the IT revolution. Um, forum papers that I just talked about earlier, but um, but I think E shape does express somebody who is adaptable. You know, um, models. And I talked a little bit about models. Um, you know, again, I'm giving you little snapshots. There's a you know, like again, it's context sensitive to the analysis. I'm not showing you everything that I I put in a report. I'm just giving you little snippets here and there, of things that I think are hopefully you'll find interesting. But I, I think this whole notion of team boundaries. Team working agreements, and then I, you know, I think a, a lot of companies don't do this, but notionally, a lot of people sort of in their agile coaching teams basically say they do, right? But uh, um, I make fun of everybody, by the way, including myself. Um, but um, the, but the thing that that even if they're notionally doing or they are doing it, um, the thing I very rarely see is this notion of a TP, team tape API, and it comes from the book Team Topologies, which I highly recommend. And and here's an example of it. Like so, each team. The problems you have is very rarely does in an organization does any one team know what other teams do, right? Or worse, how, what's the architectural design of their system? And in fact, they call this uh, sort of architectural design anthropology, where people have to go find the original MRD, and usually it's out of date and not consistent. And, you know, the, the requires time document is not like anywhere near what existed, but that's the only best that they have. How about a world where the, the team sort of makes these promises that will always support two versions. Well, here's our wiki and documentation to the best of our abilities. Here's our practices and principles. Here's how you communicate with us. Um, we, have a, we have multiple Slack channels. We have a 20, we ask us anything, which, and then by the way, Slack works when you have S, you know, SLAs, right? We say, by the way, if you go into the uh, ask me anything for our team, expect a 24-hour response. If you go into office hours, which will tell you when their prescriptive times are, we'll, we'll promise 15-minute responses, right? Um, and then we'll, and we'll make sure we show you our, you know, Kanban boards and our, you know, so um, getting near the end here, um, team complexity and cognitive nodes, a lot of this, some of this, not all of it comes from uh, the team topology again. Just having an understanding. I mean, you could say we have nothing. We don't have build run teams. We don't have two piece teams. And not, next Monday at four p at three thirty in the afternoon Eastern time, we're going to have build run teams. Or you can actually do some research and understand some of the models that work or not don't work. Um, you know, um, again, you know, the, the, there are some organizations. I think the Azure model is pretty good, they, which they use internally, which is they believe that you need, you know, like. I think there's some researchers that you need three months to bond and you won't get the effectiveness unless you're doing 12 to 18 months of keeping a team together versus sort of losing a lot of the benefit of having those sort of build run teams anyway. Uh, you know, Red Hat, we have some models. Um, I'm not a great fan of horizon based, but I, you know, I, I worked out with one client how you could do a horizon one, you know, um, you know, sort of a horizon, um, 
you know, create like if you had to have like ten teams, you could have uh, or nine teams, you could break them up in Horizon One, Horizon, uh, what is it, no, Horizon Two, and Horizon Three. I, I, don't, I always get confused, but you know, some is the innovative, the other is the sustainable. Here's some. We'll publish this. I won't go through this. This is some of the stuff where I got my information from. You know, one of my early things I got called on and said, John, where's the research from? Yeah, well, okay, let me make sure I document it. And then let's end up with incidents. Um, so, um, you know, I'm a big fan of John Osbar. If you haven't followed him, he works. Uh, he is actually working with some of the two premier resilience and uh, safety uh, cognitive labs people on the planet, uh, Dr. Woods uh, and Dr. Cook and John, and they really they really spend a lot of time on incident analysis. And, you know, John says uh, incidents are unplanned investments. Um, this is actually a, a sort of a modified quote of John. I actually did a podcast with him yesterday. Um, he said, you know, he talked about how, like, why incidents are so important, right? Incidents are signals that are the most effective directors of attention of what an organization needs for recalibration. And one of the things John said, and I think is really clear, and, and this and again, we spent a whole hour, you know, maybe we'll get John on. I, oh, we had John on last week. Hey, well, I forgot about that. I was on vacation. Um, the, the, one of the things that he says is the most interesting time of an incident is from the time the incident is, you know, um, sort of completed, right? Sometimes they're never really completed. And before you get into the big meeting, like the postmortem, I think most people spend most of their money on the big meeting. And his point is, that's where you actually get to really understand how this thing could be written and exposed as a learning opportunity. Sidney Decker says, you know, all this stuff in resilience, like a pilot is not great because they, they passed every test. A pilot, like Sully, right? If you watch that movie, Sully was great because Sully could tell stories and he listened to stories. In fact, he had a, a blog about aviation problems that were stories. So, so we need to make sure incidents are stories that we can, people want to listen to. And there's a lot more there too. Um, goals of incident management, uh, trying to get near the end. I'm getting pretty close to the end. Uh, uh, you want to reduce unplanned hours. It's just again, I think the, 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 the point that, um, it took me a while to really understand what John and Adaptive Capacity Labs were talking about is, it's economics. Like if you can shift some, the economic opportunity into the analysis of incidents, what bigger part of our organization, you know, it was, the Devos Enterprise Summit recently, um, there was a presentation by a company that talked about, you know, literally last year, um, uh, uh, what was it, like an 18 hour spanning tree incident, right? You know, I mean, I asked my network friend, should we should be having spanning tree incidents in 2019? <laughs> He's like, yeah, John, unfortunately, yes. But, but like 18 hour spanning, I mean, this is billion, this is like ridiculous money loss, right? Like we need to figure out how to invest in instance as opposed to just recording them and throwing them into dustbin documents. All right, so um, with the six minutes I have left, um, incident management opportunities. You can tell I know it's a Friday, right? Because I'm, I'm actually in a cynical, funny mood. Um, you want to learn from these investments to that point, right? Like, let's make sure that we're telling stories and we're not just filling out checklists. You know, if we think about the classic idol, we're just... We're, we're, rough, we're running up to get reports into a system that nobody learns anything about those incidents. Like it's a bean counter, it's a, it's a quantitative dashboard on some executive's, um, you know, screen. Right? Where, where, you know, if you listen to John and, and Adapt Best Labs, like we should be taking a lot more investment in how we take those stories to learn from. And there's a ton of great stuff there. Um, uh, some things about service transition improvement. There's a great book on IT. It's a 2019 book. Uh, just look for Scott Prue and CSG. He's one of the authors. It, um, this comes right out of that um, IT revolution forum paper. Um, and this is uh, where you start talking about localized authority. And it goes back to the T-shaped individuals. And you start building build run teams, right? So you're, and what, what's interesting about this kind of investment, right? It's all about economics investment, right? Like, why would you do... Why would you replicate team skills and not have it centralized? Well, maybe one is that the test person becomes a developer, the product owner becomes part of an architect, ops becomes a developer and tester, because when you're working on a team, you start, you start learning and sharing the responsibilities. And so at some point, you have a whole organization of T-shaped people. And so when you acquire another organization and everybody has to adapt to new things, the organization is the adaptive capacity of your organization, um, I think, um, Jay, Brilli Jay Bloom, who I work with, brilliantly calls this, let me show I get it right, 
wait, Jay, you're listening. Um, uh, liquid skills, liquidity, right? It's a, it's a. It, it, I think he's written some stuff on this. It's it's a brilliant way to think about a dojo. I, you know, Dao Sto, I'm a big fan of Dao Stojo. Uh, immersive learning, creating repeatable patterns. It's not like um, an excellent center. It's a place where people come over and over to enhance their craft and their skill and learn new things. Uh, Making work visible. This is another really good book on IT revolution. Oh, not book. It's a forum paper about the sort of cycle of, of, of you know work management flow from handoffs to batch size to work in progress. And then uh, sustainable approaches. Um, I, I do think you know people ask me a lot of times like, okay, John, when you leave, you know, what are we gonna do? I'm like, well, you need to find somebody that can like. So the question that comes up a lot like. I've had engagements where you know, because of the you know my schedule, their schedule, budget, all those things, you start it like and then you don't come back till six months later, which I don't recommend. But then when you get back, things are actually better. Like there was some conversations initial that actually changed some things. There were some changes that they made. And um and then the question from the CIO and the C level team is, are we done? You think we're better? I'm like, no, but like the way you find out is you do this like organizational conversation thing over again and the people will tell you if you're better worse getting better um lean coffee if you haven't experimented uh slack internal devops days if you haven't done this this is brilliant again ping me uh jay willis at redhat.com i can tell you who has done it how they've done it internal hackathons the dojo and then last but not least with three minutes man i did this it's like crazy <laughs> every tuesday we have um uh, we, we didn't have it the last two weeks, but we'll have it this Tuesday. And every Tuesday, I think we're going to do it at 2 o'clock. We're going to see if that works. We're on a crowd chat, and it's where um, a bunch of people, all of GTO and a bunch of people read at, and then a bunch of people in the industry jump on, and we have these tweet storms. And if you haven't seen the crowd chat dialogue, it's pretty awesome. And, um, and we've had a blast. And then we record those, and we put it on our YouTube channel, the Red Hat Global Channel, and we'll be adding more to material to the Red Hat channel. And I am done. Thank you so much for spending this time for you. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm easy to find. Jay Willis at redhat.com. Botch Gloop on Twitter. I won't spell it out. If, if you don't know what that is, just look for me at jaywillis at redhat.com. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. And...